Typically in the Presbyterian church, our two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, are only to be celebrated within a physical gathering of community. This is where I'm thankful that our church is reformed and always reforming. We constantly look at ourselves and the world around us so that we don't adapt to it, but we work within it to allow the spirit to change and move and reach beyond us. So in services in the future, specifically Monday, Thursday and Easter, we'll be gathering together virtually to celebrate a virtual Lord's Supper. It is no different. It'll feel different. But as we gather, I have a few things I just want to share with you. The first and foremost is that you don't want to get stuck on running out to the store to buy just the right grape juice or just the right bread. I don't want your health to be at risk. So I went downstairs to the church's kitchen to see what I could find. Surprisingly, I found no grape juice. I found prune juice. I found the very basic element of water. And I even found a bottle of La Croix. Do I think and believe and feel that since that is not grape juice or wine, that Christ is not present? Absolutely not. In this time and in this age, I know that God moves beyond our earthly means in order to show us his grace. I did not find a one loaf of bread. I did not find unleavened bread. I found simple white bread in a plastic bag. Do I believe that God can still work through this to offer to me the grace that I so desperately need? Without a doubt. I'm thankful that our denomination has given us these guidelines. I want to share a few words with you. The Sacrament of the Lord's Supper offers an abundant feast of theological meaning, including thanksgiving to God the Father, remembrance of Jesus Christ, invocation of the Holy Spirit, communion in the body of Christ, and a meal of the realm of God. The Lord's Supper also reflects our calling to feed others as we have been fed and offers a foretaste of that heavenly banquet when God will wipe away every tear and swallow up death forever. So as you celebrate this different communion with your families, I want you not to picture just this table. I want you to picture the ends of this table wrapping around the entire world so that all of God's children gather together, whether we are virtually together or physically together. We sit at that one table and remember the good and great gift of Jesus Christ. We gather as the great cloud of witnesses so that we might not only remember, but we might be fed with the spiritual food that comes from God alone. I will stand here and say the words of institution. And in your homes, when I say you may, I invite you to share with your family and your friends, whoever is there, the bread and the cup. I'm always here if you have any questions. I would be honored to speak with any of you if you have questions about how this is different for us in this day and age. In the meantime, peace and blessings. Welcome to our first ever virtual Christmas Eve service. We know this is not how you expected to send your Christmas Eve, but we're pleased and thrilled that you've chosen to spend some time in worship with us as we welcome God incarnate. God Emmanuel, God with us. Thank you to the readers, to the musicians, and to all of those that helped make the service possible. We hope to see you tomorrow on Christmas Day at three o'clock. We'll gather around the manger on the front lawn and put Jesus in the manger and sing happy birthday. Now, let us worship the Lord our God.
The white candle is placed in the middle of the wreath and lit on Christmas Eve. This candle is called the Christ candle and represents the life of Christ. The color white is for purity because Christ is our sinless, pure Savior. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praise God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those he favors. As parents, we all know that among the top of our list of peaceful moments seems to be holding a newborn sleeping baby. Looking into that tiny face and seeing the eyelids flutter and seeing them dream and you wonder and you realize what the journey is before them. Mary and Joseph, no doubt, had that fleeting moment as well. Until the shepherds showed up and the cows started mooing and the donkey made that horrible sound the donkeys could make. And Jesus was in the manger. A reading from Kneeling in Bethlehem by Anne Weems. Into this silent night, as we make our weary way, we know not where, just when the night becomes its darkest and we cannot see our path. Just then is when the angels rush in, their hands full of stars. Everything is different this year, but the one promise that never changes is the ongoing presence of God in each of our lives. A God that loves us so much that he took on flesh and dwelled among us, so that even in our darkest days, we are never alone. This is Emmanuel, God with us. The word became flesh and dwells among us, and we have seen his glory, and of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John chapter 1, verse 14. Just because we aren't able this year to carry on family traditions and gather for worship doesn't mean God chooses to stay in the heavens. The very promise of Christmas is that he breaks into our daily darkness and brings hope, love, joy, peace in today. Christ, it is our responsibility to carry the joy, hope, peace, love, and yes, the Christ child out into the darkness of the world around us. So the light of Christ that we celebrate tonight might overcome the darkness and we might once again pack our bags and travel to Bethlehem. Let us pray. God, Father, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, all the names we have for you, tonight we remember that you are Emmanuel, that you are a child who's born for us into the darkness of this world, all because of your intense and eternal love for us. Your words stream down from the heaven in the silent watches of the night, and now your church is filled with the wonder at the nearness of her God. Open our hearts to receive his life and increase our vision with the rising of dawn that our lives may be filled with his glory and peace, whose lives reign forever and ever. Amen.
Isaiah 9. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Reading from the book of Micah, chapter 5, verses 2 through 4, The Ruler from Bethlehem. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, 
From you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth.
my reading today will be from the book of Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who has said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Matthew 1, 18 to 23. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. 
because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. I'm reading from Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 16. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, 
Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, with the, which the Lord has made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Matthew 2, verses 1 through 11. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. 
After they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not recognize him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. As we've heard the red word read this evening, 
We now meditate on what it means to us in our lives today before we go to the table and celebrate our risen Lord on this Christmas Eve. Christmas is not what we expect this year. Traditionally, at this time, we're getting ready with all of our family traditions. We're cleaning the house to make sure that there's room for mom and dad and grandma and granddad and grandkids and nieces and nephews and friends and neighbors. But not this year. Christmas Eve is one of those magical nights, and I always speak of it as the veil from heaven to earth was just so thin. Because you have this, this spiritual awakening when we gather in this place, when we light the candles and we sing those familiar Christmas hymns, when we gather and see the kids in their dresses, and it's the one day of the year, I'm convinced that kids don't fight going to church because they have that ever-present nagging Santa over their heads. That's how Christmas Eve is supposed to be. And this year, I'm convinced that God is having us look at Christmas Eve in a new light. It's a brutally honest Christmas. Quarantine. It's a word we all know too well. It's a word we could also use in that very first Christmas years ago. Mary and Joseph and Jesus isolated from the world. And I'm pretty sure the animals didn't social distance. They left home and family and the comforts behind, journeyed and traveled. They were alone. We understand that this year. The Christmas story continues, and Mary and Joseph and Jesus are threatened. Their very lives are threatened. We're stuck on this one night where there's a baby, no crying he makes. Convince me of that. This baby in a manger in this idyllic scene with Mary so young and innocent and peaceful. But just days later, just time later, they were then refugees on the run, literally threatening their own lives, crossing borders to get to safety, fighting the powers that be. Yes, we understand that a little too well. There are powers in this world that are beyond our control. Yes, we understand how Christmas can be threatening. And each week we lit a candle. Joy, hope, peace, and love. And, and as we lit them, we had liturgy that we read. And you look back on it in the midst of everything going on right now today. And some people actually have said they're more wishes than faith. Where is all of the hoping this year? Are we hoping for this soon to be over? Above and beyond hoping for the coming of Christ again? Where is all the love this year? We can't even smile like we taught one another. Our love seems to be contained within our COVID circles. So we just pull ourselves away. And joy? What joy is there? Meeting grandchildren and nieces and nephews over Zoom. That does not instill joy. And peace? Cyber threats, political rallies, there's mayhem, there's protests, nobody can agree on anything. Peace. And somebody actually asked me, why not? Just cancel Christmas. But I'm reminded that each light that we've lit over the four weeks, tonight's is the most important. Whether you thought hope, love, joy, and peace were mere wishes tossed into a vast universe never to be brought to fruition, tonight we light lit the candle of Christ. That God became incarnate, became flesh, and became one of us. This is the truth that we seek. This is the truth of tonight. That even when everything else fails us, 
Everything else has vanished from the world. Christ remains. When we fill tonight, Christmas Eve, with all of the, the family traditions, and I'm all for it, we have them in our house too. But when we rest our entire Christmas faith on that, we've lost the honesty of Christmas. Because it isn't about a baby. Christmas isn't about a baby. Do you think that's what it's about? You missed the point. Christmas isn't even about family. Because the incarnate word tells us over and over again in scripture that he came to divide, to set brother against brother. And even more so than that, the incarnate God gave us a baptism that literally trumps biology. Christmas is not about family. And it's not even about what Christmas you think it might be about this year. Because we celebrate Christmas as the promise of our Savior to come again. As the promise of a Savior that will come and release us from this world in which we live. But more so than that, we profess that Christmas is about Easter. I just skipped an entire year. Christmas is about Easter. This is where the journey begins. And if you think the darkness is overwhelming and the lights are dim right now, imagine how faint they were for Mary and Joseph and Jesus. Nothing is impossible with God. That's what God told Mary. Nothing is impossible. That's what the angel said. Nothing is impossible. So it might be that God is trying to tell us something this year only we would listen. It might be that God is telling us that it's not about a baby or family or traditions or cookies or presents, but it's about a cross. That if you dare to look deep into the manger, you find a cross. You find a God that left the heavens above that had all the power and might and everything and came down to this world naked, homeless, vulnerable, threatened, isolated. And when he took on that flesh and that blood, he became one of us. And when he became one of us, that's where we understand the connection between Christmas and Easter. Because that very flesh and blood of that infant child that we remember tonight was also the flesh and blood of a man that died so that we might live. Some people find it not right to celebrate communion on Christmas Eve. Some people only want to sit in that, that moment of the joy to the world and of come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and away in a manger. Some of people want to just rethink that Jesus never cried. The truth is that God came into our broken world, our messy world, and loves us so much, so intimately, beyond any of our imagination, baptizes us into his family, takes us on as his children, and says, this is my body, and this is my blood. I give this for you. This is the feast of the people of God. This is where we gather, and it is a celebration. Just as Christmas is a celebration of new life and a journey just beginning, this is a celebration that each time we gather in this place, we know we're not alone. So my friends, join me in prayer as we give thanks to God for this gift and the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Let us pray the prayer of great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you 
and also with you. We lift our hearts up to the Lord. We lift our hearts in grateful praise. Let us pray. Tonight of all nights, Lord, on this night we remember. We remember all of the many things that you said and did, the actions that you took when you walked among us. We remember, Lord, that the journey to Bethlehem was just the beginning. We remember how scared young Mary and Joseph must have been. We remember how Mary must have, have wanted her mother and how the movement of animals in that stable or cave or barn must have woken Jesus in a quiet slumber. We remember that Mary and Joseph were no doubt confused and scared, but they were not alone. You, Lord, as an angel came and spoke to shepherds and sent them to meet your son. You, O oh Lord, spoke to wise men, to the Magi, and brought them to give gifts and pay homage to the king. You, O oh Lord, gave them wisdom to return home another way. And you, O oh Lord, became so woman, so helpless, in order that you might understand our humanity. And we give you thanks, Lord, for this night, when it all began. And we give you thanks that on this night, Lord, we not only celebrate what has passed, but we celebrate and anxiously and hopefully look forward for what is to come as you promised Christ will come again and that we will be released from this darkness and given the eternity of light. Lord, as we gather around the corners of the earth literally tonight, and all different places where you have made homes worship, where you have taken the word into a believer's heart that has never stepped foot in the church, where you, O Lord, are working beyond our imagination to become incarnate again. You became flesh. Inspire us, Lord, to take that risk as well. Give us the strength and Lord, feed us with this bread and this cup so that as we join together in communion, though we are not side by side, Lord, we are one family grafted into yours as brothers and sisters in Christ, adopted children, heirs of the promise. And in that, Lord, we give thanks. And on this night of Christmas Eve, we ask you in your mercy, to bless those that are hungry, bless those that are isolated and alone, bless those that are threatened, bless those that are refugees, bless those that are homeless, bless those that have homes and families, bless those that have health, and help us to be grateful for not just your Son, Jesus Christ, but all that you give us. For it is through your Son's name that we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ took the bread. And after having blessed it, he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. And in like manner, he took the cup and he said, This is the blood of the new covenant. This is my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, 
You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again, for he is our risen Lord. My friends, in your homes, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Lord, we have really no way to fathom the vastness of your love for us. We cannot begin to imagine that first night in which you came into the world. We cannot imagine you giving your own life so that we sinners might live. We cannot understand the mystery that is before us, but we give thanks. For through your good and gracious and loving Son, we are saved. Through his name, his holy and precious name. Amen. My friends, Merry Christmas, but don't keep the news to yourself, for unto us today a child is born, a Savior, Emmanuel, God with us. Go, tell it on the mountain, tell it in the valleys, tell it everywhere you might go or be, so that God's name might be great. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. And amen.
Jesus, Lord.